For centuries, man had but his own two eyes to explore the wonders of his world. Then he invented the microscope, a mighty eye, and discovered the fantastic universe beyond the limits of his own meager sight. Now your adventure through inner space has begun. Through Monsanto's mighty microscope, you will travel into the incredible universe found within a tiny fragment of a snowflake. I am the first person to make this fabulous journey. Suspended in the timelessness of inner space are the thought waves of my first impressions. They will be our only source of contact once you have passed beyond the limits of normal magnification. 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 Hey folks, welcome to another VR video. Today we're going to look at some things that aren't there anymore. Things that are defunct within Disneyland or previous parks. Uh, this is Project Snowflake. Which is a recreation of Adventures Through Inner Space. I am becoming smaller and smaller. Which is actually where Star Tours is now. These tiny bits of snowflake crystal in Tomorrowland. Above me, like an enormous wall of ice. Can I penetrate this gigantic prism? And yet this wall of ice only seems smooth and solid. From this tiny viewpoint, I can see that nothing is solid, no matter how it appears. I love that you can see the lighting on the backs of the cars and things of that nature. Uh, this was one of Disney's dark rides, to uh, and what compelling force draws me into this mysterious darkness? Can this be the threshold of inner space? As you can hear, it has you shrinking inside the molecules of a snowflake. It was a two-seater, as you can see, so people. Uh, Probably teenagers and adults uh, use this ride for different reasons than education, probably. What are these strange spheres? If I reach the universe of the molecule? Yes. These are water molecules, H2O. They vibrate in such an orderly pattern because this is water frozen into the solid state of matter. These fuzzy spheres must be the atoms that make up the molecule. Two hydrogen atoms bonded to a single oxygen atom. And I see it's the orbiting electrons that give the atom its fuzzy appearance. And still I continue to shrink. Is it possible that I can enter the atom itself? Electrons are dashing about me like so many fiery comets. Can I possibly survive? the wall of the oxygen atom. I am so infinitely small now that I can see millions of orbiting electrons. They appear like the Milky Way of our own solar system. This vast realm, this is the infinite universe within a tiny speck of snowflake crystal. And there, is the nucleus of the atom. Do I dare explore the vastness of its inner space? No, I dare not go on. I must return to the realm of the molecule 
before I go on shrinking forever. Oh, how strange. The molecules are so active now. They have become fluid, freed from their frozen state. That can only mean that the snowflake is melting. Melting. Yes, the snowflake has melted, but there is no cause for alarm. You are back on visual and returning to your normal size. This has been one of many exciting adventures through inner space in a never-ending search for new ways to rearrange molecules for the benefit of mankind. Now, in our display area, you will see modern miracles created by rearranging the molecules of not only water, but of air, coal, petroleum, and many other raw materials. This is Monsanto. Well, there you have it. <laughs> An ad for Monsanto. So we are now in a second experience here. This is Project Fairwinds, which is a second Disney Historical Institute experience. As you can see, there's a one, a two, a three, a four, a five. I'm not sure why there are eight different pedestals here. Now, what I'm wondering is, like, do they have buttons on them or things to press? No. Oh, they do. Said Roland, he said they came Okay. So there are different things to talk through here. So this is the Tower of the Four Winds, uh, which was an experience that was built for the World's Fair uh, by the United States Committee for UNICEF and, of course, Walt Disney. And it looks a little bit like what you'd see today at Disneyland in the outside, at least, of It's a Small World. So let's go ahead and let's go through the narrative here. I didn't realize that I've, I've never done this experience before. I've been assigned to design the Tower of the Four Winds because Walt remembered all my propellers and said, Rolly says, I want to do this big tower out in front with nothing but mobiles and propellers. And I said, fine. So I was designing that and building a model on it. Uh, I built a small model. I built a little model that was probably not more than 12 inches high that fit into a model that we were using as a promo model uh, to take photographs of to show small world in our brochures. And then from there, I did a half-inch scale model of it. And the half-inch scale model that I actually built, every propeller turned in it. I think we had like 80 propellers in it, and it turned. That's pretty cool. So we're going to, after each one of these, go up and, and look at some of this here. So as you can see, there's some pretty in intricate detail. And this is, of course, something that doesn't really exist anymore. Like I said, it kind of resembles what's on the outside at Disneyland of It's a Small World, but it's definitely not as awesome as this. So this is an actual picture of some of the construction of this from Bill Cotter. So we're going to go do number two now. is they, they would build a fake wed over on one of the sound stages and then Walt would walk around the fake wed and talk to the different show designers about what it is that you're working on and then you you know you'd talk back to him and so he came over to me and he said Roland he says I'm just going to come over and talk to you a little bit about the tower and if I remember correctly Walt just started saying at the World's Fair we're going to have a, a boat ride for children from around the world and our marquee is going to be a the tower of the four winds and i'm standing there and, and it was really weird because i i didn't know what to say or what to do when the camera was on me so i was just kind of blowing on the propellers and kind of hitting the propellers with my fingers to show that they actually worked and walt said something to me about is this, is this the tower of the four winds i said yes and, and so then he he pointed to one of the little balls that was swinging around and he says what's that I said, oh, I think that's going to be like a little carousel, and it's probably going to be a little horse that's kind of going around. So he asked me a couple of little questions. So 
So you can see that little carousel that he was referring to right there. Many different animals. Pretty cool. Let's see what the second picture is here. This is actually people walking up to it. Now, this was the outside entrance to It's a Small World at the World's Fair. Um, now, I'm obviously not old enough to have attended the World's Fair, uh, but I'm sure it was something to marvel at. I, I don't know what the other buildings were like, so. Subcontracted to an engineering firm called uh, Taggart and Cass. And Taggart and Cass uh, engineered it because they were concerned about the wind loads in New York because of hurricane conditions. So they, they over engineered it. And pipes that were six inches in diameter became, you know, uh, nine inches in diameter. The center column that was nine inches in diameter became two feet in diameter. And what happened was the, the whole thing become, it, it lost the delicacy that I had in the original design. And the problem was that we were under a short time frame to engineer it and build it. We actually built it here in Los Angeles and shipped it to New York. And was it if we'd have the time, I could have added more structural pieces to tie it together more, like, like a cobweb and we could have kept it delicate, but as it turned out, um, it didn't happen. There's pictures of he and I looking at the model and on television with the model. And then for him to actually see it in person, realizing how much it, it, it exploded, he was very much aware of the over-engineering of it. And he was being very faithful to the engineers and the fact of saying that they're doing that because of safety, and I understand that. And I told him, I said, well, I don't disagree with the concern of safety. I said, I just wish that they could have done it in a, a much more delicate way, which I think they could have if there had been more cross-bracing in the des actual design that I did, but we didn't have time to go back and do that, you know. So you can see the thickness of these pipes as I walk closer to it here. And apparently that was because of the potential of hurricanes in New York during the World's Fair. It's crazy. And again, some more people. And you can see it, it truly did say United States Committee for UNICEF. There were people manning the booths there. Uh, and again, this is a pretty faithful look at the Tower of the Four Winds. Obviously, it looks like the seven dwarfs were hanging out in this particular picture. They're not present right now in this recreation. The other thing that happened was I called out to have the paint on, on the major structure done in, in a gold metallic. And boy, they just said, no, we can't do gold car metallic. That's gonna to be too expensive. And, and this and that and the other thing and so they came back with sort of a kind of a somewhere I don't know what you want to call it we used to call it baby poop color I mean it was just kind of a, a kind of a ochre and I hated the, the color of the ochre but again we were on a fast track so this was all originally going to be gold as well it's really interesting to see and hear this story of the Tower of the Four Winds. And look, there's Snow White also. And I see now what he was referring to. It's almost like a like a pink color. You can't really see that in the recreated version. And this must be the little scale model that he was referring to earlier in the interviews here. pretty awesome you can even see the little booth cut out there that's nice all right so let's go see what number five has to say and Walt said Roland he said they came in one day and he said the star of the four winds is ready for a buy-off and you and I've got to go down and see it and I've been down taking pictures of it and seeing it and I, I, I hate to tell you this but I hated it I was really unhappy with it and because it was, you know, something that was very special to me as far as being a kinetic sculpture. So we, I drove Walt down to show it to him, and Walt took a look at it. He said, well, Walt, what do you think? And I said, I think it's a piece of crap. And he says, it can't be a piece of crap. It only cost me 
$200,000, almost a quarter of a million. He says, it can't be. And he said, besides that, I like it. I said, okay, fine. I'm glad Walt liked it if it cost $200,000. That's pretty crazy. So let's go see this next picture here. And you can see the sun with, with the fan going there, which is pretty cool. So this is, again, from this same angle. It's strange to me, though. It does not look pink from most of the angles. It's, it's only been that one shot with Snow White that was really like that pinkish color. All right, we've got three more of these to go. World's Fair, and I must admit, it, it did its job. It was very successful at the World's Fair. A lot of people remembered it. It was very special, and nobody was looking at it <laughs> through the eyes of the designer. And I did learn one thing, that the public sees things a lot differently than we do, and as critical as we are on our work, 50% of what we're critical about, well, the, the comp I mean, the uh, public never sees. So we, sometimes you have to be real careful that you don't over-design because the public's not going to see it any. I probably, if, if I was going to the World's Fair, I probably wouldn't have stared at this with this much intent. It would have just been the window dressing to the actual attraction inside. So let's see what this one looks like. Oh, it's a person like hanging from the structure. That's got to be scary. Probably one of the construction people. See what number seven has to say. So what happened was, Walt wanted to bring it back to Disneyland, and I was called in one day by Dick Irvine, and uh, basically uh, Dick Irvine and uh, said, "Roland, you're on the hot seat." And I said, "What do you mean the hot seat?" He said, "Well, he says we've got to, we don't want the power of the four winds at Disneyland." And I said, well, neither do I. I said, it's, it's ugly. And I said, besides, I've got the clock. I'm building, I'm, you know, designing a clock out front. I said, putting the top of the four winds in front of the clock would just destroy the clock. It'd be ugly. And they said, well, we want you to tell Walt that you don't want the top of the four winds there. And I said, why? And they said, well, because, and there was Roger Brogy Jr., the, uh, Roger Brogy Sr., rather, that said, I don't want to maintain it. Mel Mountain, who was the head of finances, says, it's going to cost too much money to bring it back. There was another person that said it's a safety issue. We don't want that. And four or five people had reasons that they didn't want it in Disneyland. But they had decided that Rolly should tell Walt not to bring it back. So we had the meeting with Walt. And um, we finished up the meeting and, and on Small World, about bringing Small World back. And so we got ready to close the meeting. And Walt said, is that it? And I said, uh, no, sir. I said, uh, about the Tower of the Four Winds. And he said, what about the Tower of the Four Winds? And I said, I don't think we should bring it back. He said, what do you mean you, we, you shouldn't bring it back? And I said, I don't think we should bring it back. I said, I said, we've done the clock. And I said, you put it in front of the clock. You've got confetti in front of confetti. I said, I think it, aesthetically it won't work. And I said, if we were to ever to have it, I said, you know, I hate it anyway. And I said, you know, if we were ever to have, uh, ever do it again, I'd like to do it inside of a building to work. It'd be delicate and really a very attractive piece of work. And so all of a sudden he kind of leaned back in his chair and he looked over and he said to Mel Mel, are you concerned about how much it's going to cost to bring it back? And Mel said, well, well no, Walt, he said, but uh, uh, yeah, there was a little concern there. And he said, uh, Roger Boogie said, uh, does the maintenance of it concern you a little bit? And, well, no, 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 Walt. I mean, we can, we, we can, I mean, we, and these guys started backing down, but at the same time they said, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, then I realized Walt knew that they had set me up. And so what happened was he went right around the table and asked every one of them their concerns about the Tower of the Four Winds, and then he realized what had happened. So when the meeting was over, he said, okay, we won't bring it back. And so everybody was up and out of the door just like that, and as he was getting up, I grabbed his coattail. And I said, well, does it, does it really bother you that we're not bringing it back? And he says, no, not at all. So that's the good story of the clock also from the outside of It's a Small World. Like I said, it kind of resembled this, and now it makes sense because it was the same designer. And let's see this last picture here. And this, I guess, is after they've torn it down. 
after they've struck it. Let's see what number eight has to bring. And I like that even the shadow is here. It's pretty awesome. Well, it's in the ocean. They cut it up under two foot lengths and threw it in the ocean. In Atlanta, and on the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. It's all rusted out by now, I'm sure. <laughs> So they cut it up into segments and threw it in the Atlantic Ocean. That's interesting. So we're going to walk behind the structure here. Uh, and of course, this would have been the entrance here to It's a Small World. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have It's a Small World to go through. But look, there's the sun. And here's the back, the Tower of the Four Winds. And again, this is something that was there for a short period of time during the World's Fair in New York, and then not there, but brought back to life. In virtual reality. We've got one more ride to take a look at. Let's see if I can cross past these fences here. No, of course not. So we've got one more ride to ch check out. Uh, this is the most recent one now that we're going to move into in just a moment. Uh, all three of these experiences were made with love. The first two were actually made by the Disney Historical Institute. Uh, this third one is actually made by a company called Defunct Land. So for our last attraction here, we're actually going to visit defunct land now the first thing i want to tell you is this attraction right here this giant sorcerer's apprentice hat is actually a defunct attraction at walt disney world uh, in the hollywood studios area this used to be somewhere you could take a photo op or you could walk under or you could walk through stand next to mickey's magical hands uh, but unfortunately, when they built Galaxy's Edge, this was something that they took out. Um, so it is no longer a part of Disneyland, or, or I'm sorry, Disney World, but it is now part of Defunct Land, which is pretty sweet. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is, in Disney parks, you'll see Pardon Our Pixie Dust with these big walls. Uh, here in Defunct Land, it says Pardon Our Pixel Dust, of course. And then, as you can see over here, these characters are not all Disney properties, and that's important to note because Defunct Land is going to continue to expand and it's not always going to be Disney attractions. So now we're going to walk over to our main attraction for today. Uh, we're going to walk past another attraction on the way that I'll tell you about. Uh, but our main attraction for this video, as well as defunct land right now at least their first attraction is a submarine voyage uh, that may be familiar if you're a little bit older so this is the pretzel which was an old ride uh, tickets for this one cost 10 cents it is not yet fully operational but you can see the front of the ride here uh, that may be something that defunct land adds later uh, but over here as we move a little bit closer, this is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea Submarine Voyage, which is a ride that used to be in Disney Parks uh, and has since been replaced by a Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage. But for many years, this is an attraction that you could go to the Disney Parks. And it did actually submerge you underwater. We've got all different flags here. Lots of detail put in this experience, more so than I've ever seen uh, in a ride recreation by far. Uh, as you can see here, we've got the creators. So we've got Ryan Trumbull, Jamie Holding, Joseph Stella. And I knew this was going to happen. I can't pronounce this gentleman's last name. But you can see all of the people from Defunct Land that built this. Uh, and I love the way that they arranged them in stone here. 
So thank you and hats off to you folks for creating this awesome experience. Uh, across from the voyage, at one point at least, uh, was this 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea cinema show. So for 10 cents, or if you had a ticket book, you could give a coupon to the operator. And you could actually go in and watch the film 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in a cinescope, cinemascope presentation. So it's cool that they have that theater backdrop over here as well. Uh, but now comes one of the coolest experiences I've done as a ride in virtual reality. I mean, even the benches have pretty ridiculous graphics, really, really immersive in nature and the ways paper mask is, of course. We're going to head over here. You can see from this sign for 20,000 leagues under the sea from this point it would have been a 45 minute wait see much of a line today we're going to go ahead and move forward we can embark right here before we do that though I just want to show you two other things there's the wheelchair entrance over there and here's where you used to enter so so it's very cool and very true to life. Now we're going to embark. And unfortunately, we're a little tall, so we're going to squat. Secure ship for sea. Make all preparations for getting underway. Aye, aye, sir. All hands to safety. Stay up on the line. of the undersea world. The great green sea turtles, for instance, are the reptilian patriarchs of the deep. These amphibious descendants of the dinosaur have changed little in the past 200 million years. Groupers, or giant sea bass, roam the coastal bottoms in search of food. The giant clam, obviously, is quite safe from such marine predators. The fish world has always been considered a silent habitat, but with our sonar hydrophones, we've discovered that fish actually talk. Listen. Satellite ships. 
They are harvesting the abundance that nature has sown here beneath the sea. Kelp beds are cultivated, sea creatures corralled and protected from predators, just as terrestrial shepherds protect their flocks from ravenous wolves. Weather alert, all controls eight degrees down. Shark versus octopus. Hold her at 80 fathoms and proceed on course. can dive safely below the violence of ocean storms. Surface vessels are not so fortunate. Witness the evidence of their fate. The graveyard of lost ships. For ages, these rotting holes have kept their secret treasures, safeguarded by silent sentinels of the deep. Man-eating sharks, nature's most unpredictable predators of the sea. Steady as she goes. In this region of the polar ice cap, you are witnessing a rare visual phenomenon. The aurora borealis above us. This looks so awesome. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. And keep an eye on the depth gauge. I almost feel like this section in particular feels better than it was the North Pole and are now descending into that region in deeper water where the sun has never penetrated. Here, in this realm of eternal darkness, nature has provided her creatures with their own eerie luminescence. Take her back up to 80 fathoms. There are limits beyond which man and his puny efforts cannot survive. We have almost exceeded those limits. Unusual formation of port and starboard, sir. Ah, these crumbling heaps of stone betray the hand of man. I believe we've made a startling discovery. These classic ruins could very well be the legendary lost continent of Atlantis. Some scholars theorize that a remarkable civilization was destroyed by a tremendous volcano. Others treat any concept of Atlantis as pure fantasy, along with legends of sea serpents and mermaids. Beg your pardon, sir, but did you say sea serpents are mere fantasies? Belay there, mate. Anyone in his right mind knows there's no such thing as a sea serpent or mermaids. Mr. Baxter, if you think you're seeing mermaids and sea monsters, You've been submerged too long. Pretty sure we saw sea serpents in the By Neptune's flippers, this confirms it. That seething mountain still denies rest to the civilization it submerged thousands of generations ago. Helmsman, stay clear of the tottering columns. Red alert! Red alert! All hands to the Trim the tanks! Good lord! It's one of ours! Its hull has been crushed like an eggshell! Another monster is attacking forwards! Full repellent charge! Repellent charge, my eye! Maximum voltage! All ahead! This reminds me of Day of the Tentacle. Emergency maneuver! All engines! Stand by to surface! Surface! Proceed on course! All ahead! Station the maneuvering watch. Aye, 
before we fade out, I just want to show you. This is the actual seat that you would fold down and sit on also. So this is all very much what you would have experienced in the ride. It's, it's tremendous what they've done. In just a few moments, we will be docking at Vulcania, our home port. It has been a pleasure having you aboard the Nautilus on this memorable voyage that has taken us 20,000 leagues the under the sea. Exit ride right there. It's actually automatically going to figure this out when we get to the exit point. Captain to bridge. Reduce speed and proceed to number four berth. Stand by to dock. Bridge, aye aye. All ahead, run third. Stand by the mooring line. Thank you for sailing with us. And now, when the cabin lights come on, please stand. And now we've faded out and stand back up here. And as you can see, the sign says exit. And that's also what I'm going to do for today. I'm going to head out back here. You can see there's, there's no way to actually exit right now. Pardon our pixel dust. But I hope you've enjoyed this look at three defunct experiences recreated in virtual reality. Uh, this is something that is probably going to continue to happen over and over again with things that aren't there anymore bringing them back in virtual reality. I love it. I hope there's more and more of this in the future. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'll be back with more content soon. Until next time, get out there and enjoy some VR for yourself. And thanks for watching. As we get to Mixie, Mickey's hat here, I'm going to say bye-bye now.